Okay, so I'm here to talk to you today about um, our unique approach to treating patients with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So just a little background about us. Um, we've been treating EDS patients for over 10 years now, and our practice currently sees over 125 EDS patients per week. Primarily, we see a classical and hypermobile types of EDS. So um, if you do the math, that's a lot of people. Um, so we've been really fortunate to work with thousands of EDS patients over the years, uh, which has really given us um, a good feel for kind of a lot of common things that, that can occur um, and just really get to know the population very well. Uh, one thing that we do as well as treating our, our local patients that come to us every week is we perform a, a four-hour consultation where people who don't live close by who may just come in uh, once, we've also had people who come in and they might stay a week or a month, um, and we kind of go through everything uh, with them, their entire body. We kind of go joint by joint, uh, assessing all the problems that we can find. We uh, go through treatment techniques, uh, taping techniques, things like that, and we kind of go through uh, the family members as well and kind of help them learn some techniques. And we wrote a, our book, uh, Living Life to the Fullest with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and that kind of outlines our entire exercise protocol and kind of what we do with our patients. So EDS, as many of you know, is an inherited connective tissue disorder, uh, which affects the collagen. And the collagen you can kind of think as the glue that supports many structures in the body, affects the skin, the ligaments, muscles, organs, and blood vessels. And as we've heard today from a lot of the other lectures, pretty much affects everything that goes on with you on a daily basis. So how do we look at a patient? Um, so we look at patients through what's called biomechanical lenses. So Biomechanics is the study of mechanical laws that relating to the movement or structure of living organisms. So basically we're gonna look at the way you move um, and what we wanna do as physical therapists is restore proper biomechanics to the, a specific joint. And the way we're gonna do that is through manual therapy and exercise. So again, as, as many other speakers talked about today, you know, there's other things that can be affecting your, your movement and your joints, such as mast cell and POTS and things like that. So we want to make sure that we're referring the patient out to other members of the healthcare team to help with those issues, because PT can't fix, um, you know, all these other systemic issues that are going on with you, and you want to make sure that you get those taken care of so that you can do the physical therapy. So manual therapy techniques that we utilize in our practice, uh, to name a few of the, the techniques that we use are muscle energy techniques, craniosacral therapy techniques, mulligan techniques, myofascial release, taping. Um, and then again, another big thing that we do is we try to teach patients uh, how to fix their own um, issues or help have family members fix them. Because again, it is a chronic condition that, you know, it's going to be with you for, for the rest of your life and things are always going to kind of come up and, and occur that we want to give you, you know, as, as many tools to kind of help yourself that, that you can. So our exercise protocol, um, we spent many, many months, many years kind of figuring out what exercises are, are good for the EDS population, because um, exercises that may be good for someone else who's not hypermobile may not, not work for someone who is hypermobile. So we kind of looked at each exercise that we wanted to strengthen all the, the joints and muscles of the body, but looking at how it affects other, other um, joints. So maybe it's a shoulder exercise, but it may affect your hip. And we kind of, you know, look at that as a whole. And we also, again, someone else had mentioned today too, about slow progression of exercise to decrease the risk of in injury. And what we found with the EDS population is we can't um, have an aggressive uh, progression. Um, again, slow and steady wins the race as the, we saw the tortoise just a minute ago. Um, so that's definitely something that we follow. So how can you decrease your joint pain? So first of all, you, we need to figure out why does a joint sublux? So it's, it's you know, simply that if the external forces of the environment are greater than the ligamentous strength and the muscular strength of a joint, then the joint will sublux. If it's not, then it won't. So to give you an example, uh, let's say you're gonna go do laundry and you're carrying your laundry basket. And every time you carry the, the full laundry basket, your shoulder subluxes. So, that's because the, the forces of the weight of the laundry basket is greater than the strength of, of your shoulder. So as physical therapists, we want to say, how do we keep that joint from subluxing? So there's the, the ways that we're going to do that is either strengthen the muscles, we're going to modify the activity or brace for the activity. So again, with this example of the laundry for strengthening the muscles around the joint, if, if carrying the laundry basket is the problem, maybe we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on strengthening the rotator cuff muscles and the shoulder um, stabilizers so that when you carry that basket of laundry, now your shoulder doesn't, doesn't sublux. And those are the exercises that are listed in our book. 
Uh, the other way would be to modify the activity so that there's less forces on the joint. So maybe you carry half a basket of laundry. So now that, that basket weighs half as much and now your shoulder doesn't uh, sublux because you can handle that lesser weight. The other uh, method would be to either brace or tape for that activity. So we may tape your shoulder, may give you a brace so that now you carry the basket of laundry. And again, it stabilizes your shoulder so that you don't sublux the joint. And again, with the bracing and taping, uh, we, you know, I, ideally we want to brace or tape for an activity, not for the rest of your life. Um, so again, we're going to kind of modify that for, you know, what you need for different activities that you're doing. <laughs> So what causes joint pain in people who have EDS? So there's, there's many things, unfortunately, that can cause pain. Um, so systemic issues, which again, we heard a lot about today from the other speakers, uh, the POTS, GI issues, mast cell, food allergies, those can all cause global inflammation throughout your body, which is gonna lead towards pain. Um, there's neurological reasons that can cause pain, CCI, AAI, tethered cord, Chiari malformation, bulging discs, spondylolisthesis. So those are all things that can contribute to pain as well. And then just simply injuries uh, that, you know, EDS or non-EDS people can get like labral tears, meniscal tears, fractures, things like that. Um, and we always say when in doubt, refer it out. So if there's something going on with a patient that just doesn't make sense to us, or we've tried some physical therapy interventions that aren't helping, we want to, you know, look into these other reasons that it could be and then refer to the proper practitioner for that. Um, and then there's biomechanical issues, which is um, mainly what the physical therapy would focus on, the joint hypermobility, the subluxations or dislocations, um, muscle or tendon tears, muscle spasm, things like that. And that's what physical therapy is gonna focus on helping. So again, the systemic issues, uh, what do they do, as I just said, causes the global inflammation throughout the body. And the way that that directly kind of correlates to what we're trying to do is that if you're inflamed, it's going to impede the muscle activation and strength. So now it's more difficult for you to do the exercises because the, the muscle can't work properly. Um, and if you are inflamed, you're going to have an increased chance for the joints to sublux, which again is going to lead to more pain. So we really want to kind of get, if you do have an issue with the inflammation, we want to make sure that there's a team member that's helping with that. And with neurological issues, so basically a nerve goes into a muscle and stimulates uh, motor units to fire. So a muscle, let's say for sake of argument, is made up of 100 motor units. So if 100 motor units fire, you'll get the maximal contraction of the muscle. Um, if no motor units fire, then the muscle's flaccid and you get no contraction at all. So a nerve is going to regulate how many motor units fire to determine how strong that muscle can contract. So an example would be if you're, um, say, giving a handshake, a strong handshake, you're going to recruit more motor units than if you're doing a weak handshake. So again, the purpose of this is to tell you that if the nerve is damaged, it can't fire as many motor units. So now your your muscle isn't going to be able to contract the, the way it, it needs to. Again, leading to being susceptible to more subluxations, more pain, and, and less function. Um, so again, looking at just injuries, people with EDS can also have common injuries that you know everyone else gets, meniscal tears, rotator cuff tears, bursitis, tendonitis, and if those injuries aren't fixed, um, then you're still going to have pain from those injuries. So keeping in mind that um, that you want to, um, you know, address injuries as well. Um, and injuries sometimes can be fixed with traditional PT, te PT techniques um, and with modified exercises from our book. And some people, you know, based on the injury may need surgery, but again, that's always a last resort. We want to kind of try conservative methods first. And to decrease your pain, again, we've talked a lot today about a team approach and other contributing factors that can affect uh, your pain and function. So uh, we call this team awesome, that we want all our patients to have a, a great team that can support them and take care of all the issues that may arise. Um, so common uh, doctors that a EDS patient may require would be a geneticist, a primary care physician, pain doctor, cardiologist, neurosurgeon, neurologist, gastroenterologist, a nutritionist to do food allergy testing, uh, mast cell doctor, pulmonologist, dentist, and of course, the physical therapist. So I uh, mean, quite a, a large team to kind of help with all the issues that may arise. And the way we kind of look at an EDS patient is if you kind of think of a, a pie and all the pieces of the pie need to, um, you know, get addressed to be able to treat the patient as a whole and kind of take care of everything. And we need to clear out the other issues to be able for the patient to be successful with physical therapy. And like I mentioned before, the cardiac issues, neurological issues, GI, um, other health issues, um, to make sure that we are addressing all, all the problems to help the patient be as successful as they can with physical therapy. 
So how do we assess someone dur during our four hour consultation? So we're gonna determine, again, like I said before, if we need help from other practitioners. So we kind of make patients a to-do list. If we are, we do a quick screening to kind of ask about symptoms to see if we're questioning mast cell or POTS or tethered cord, things like that. And we're gonna kind of give them a list of practitioners that they need to see if, if they need those things addressed. Um, then we're going to go through every joint in the body, determine why it hurts. Again, before where I talked about the biomechanical reasons, you may come in and say, you know, my, my main complaint is, you know, my neck pain, but potentially your neck pain might be coming from your shoulders. So we want to kind of assess where it's coming from so that we can properly treat it. Um, then we're going to develop a problem list. So all the major problems that you're experiencing, and then we're going to come up with a plan of, of how to address each of those problems. Um, and then we're also going to, you know, talk about your lifestyle, you know, are you, um, you know, do you work, do you have kids, um, you know, and, and kind of come up with some ways to possibly modify your lifestyle. Maybe you're doing something every day that you don't even know you're, you know, you're causing yourself pain and we can kind of help you through that. Or if you do have something that, you know, you're really passionate about and you want to continue it, but it does give you pain, we can try to maybe help you figure out a way to still do that, um, that activity, but without causing yourself pain. Um, and then, again, we're, we're really big on teaching family members how to help patients with EDS. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, family members feel pretty helpless, you know, watching their, their family member, you know, go through all these things. And we try to really, um, you know, give you as many techniques as we possibly can to, you know, help with um, um, either, you know, doing some adjustments on the person or doing a taping technique and things like that to, to help with pain and, and help uh, increase your function. And then we go through the exercises in the book. We're going to teach you how to do the exercises, make sure you're doing them right. If you are having a problem with the exercises, um, there are some modifications listed in the book for common issues that patients have, but then sometimes we even have to make modifications to the modifications. So um, we'll kind of go through that with you and make sure that you're able to do the exercises without, without pain because they are, you know, intended, to, you know, the exercises are not intended to hurt you. So if they're hurting, something's wrong and we need to figure that out and, and help you um, reason through that. So I'm going to pass the torch on to Kevin and he's going to go through low back assessment. She did great. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, if you were here yesterday, I talked about how I assess somebody with EDS, um, mostly for the doctors. Today I'm going to talk about is where your pain comes from, because um, it comes from uh, several factors. Uh, that totally was not what I wanted to do. Uh, how do I get that back? The blind guy. Um, it should go back. Uh oh. That's supposed to go back. Previous. Hang on. Uh, previous. Okay. I click previous. All right. So let's talk a little bit about where your pain comes from. So the first thing we look at when we look with someone at EDS is we look at the SI joint. Okay. The SI joint is the two dimples of your butt. The reason why you have two dimples of your butt is there is no muscle that crosses the SI joint. It's all ligamentous in nature. So when we're looking at biomechanics and we're looking at forces related to actual joints. So the first thing I want to tell you is that two thirds of my body weight traveled down my spine, make an oblique angle at my SI joint and traveled down my foot. Every time my foot hits the ground, the ground pushes up with equal and opposite pressure. That is called a ground reaction force. The ground reaction force for walking is three times my body weight, goes up through my ankle, knee, hip, up through my SI. Um, and when I run into a jump, it is 10 times my body weight. So again, when people say, why shouldn't I run with EDS? Whatever you weigh, put a zero behind it and tell me how much force you got to push up through that knee and everything like that. It's pretty tough. So I have three to t uh, 10 times my body weight traveling up through my SI joint and two thirds of my body weight traveling down through my spine. So therefore in a joint that has no muscle that crosses it, just ligamentous in nature in a genetic disorder that has bad ligaments. Everybody has an SI joint problem. I almost guarantee it. All right. I've probably seen close to 10,000 EDS patients in my career at this stage. I have never seen someone without an SI joint problem. So the major SI joint problem we have, and I don't know how to make, uh, make this into a little, uh, how do I get the little cursor thing going? With the mouse? There you go. So if you look at here, this is called the innominate bone. When we look at this, 
as this pushes up, this goes superior. We call that an upslip in osteopathic medicine. When that occurs, it makes this leg shorter and this leg longer. It's actually apparent. All right, so it's not a true leg length discrepancy, which means that the bone is longer, which will actually affect your gait. It can affect your knees, your ankles, and your hips. So we're gonna go through every single one of the dysfunctions when you come to our clinic and address each one. How we actually do it is we actually fix it right there in the clinic because some dysfunctions will mask other dysfunctions. So you need to actually clear the whole SI joint out first. After that, we're gonna actually look at the hips. Again, I do a, a lecture on SI joint function and the name of the lecture is the hip runs the show. So I find that when the hip is unstable, it'll cause SI joint dysfunction because you're actually trying to contract some of the musculature in the low back, primarily the quadratus and the psoas to pull that hip up. Um, after we do that, we're gonna assess some hypermobility in the spine. And of course, you guys can definitely have some bulging discs. The way you actually know whether you have an SI joint problem or a disc problem, the SI joint does not refer pain past the knee ever. If you have pain past the knee, it's usually some kind of neurological problem with like a disc or a pinched nerve in your low back, okay? So after we fix the low back, we're looking at the knee, the hip, and the ankle, okay? There's a good uh, course that we go to from Gary Gray in America. When the foot hits the ground, everything changes. So we're always looking at the foot. Most people with EDS have a flat foot, and that is, again, because mostly it's ligamentous in nature that holds the arches up. Um, the musculature in the foot is fairly small, and it's difficult to actually stabilize the foot using the musculature itself. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to use some taping techniques just for an evaluation pot for us to figure out if you need custom orthotics. I have gone through every over-the-counter arch support known to me in America. I have not gone through Canada ones. None has actually helped me. I really need a custom orthotic for, to achieve what I'm looking to achieve um, and what I need. So I usually get a soft orthotic. So in America, there are softer, hot orthotics. Um, and whatever practitioner, one does a soft, one does a hard, nobody does both. I don't know how it is in Canada. The reason why I'm looking for a soft orthotic is it's easily adjustable on the fly because we're gonna need to make many adjustments with it. You guys have a lot of ligamentous laxity and a lot of bones in the foot move different ways. So you're gonna actually need to control that. They're not gonna get it on the first time, I guarantee you. So with my orthotist who lives literally three minutes away from my clinic. I tape your foot, I put it in place, I make it perfect. I send it to him, he casts it with the tape on and we still need three to four adjustments to make it perfect. So it's not a perfect technique when someone goes for a, to get an orthotic. So we need to kind of figure that stuff out and we gotta play with it. So the one thing I learned with EDS, you know, doing this for the length that I've done, nothing's perfect. So we're gonna to have to keep evaluating and constantly assessing it. Um, the one thing we're gonna know is that when the foot is flat, there is your ankle joint, is your talus, will actually translate forward in the socket. So when you're walking, if you get that anterior pain in the front part of the ankle, it's usually due to the talus being sublux forward and it's causing pain right there. The most physical therapists can do some joint mobilizations to that talus to fix that. But again, until the foot actually stops pronating, um, we're not gonna be able to fix it at all. So the foot again controls that. The second thing is the knee bends in. So I'll actually show that. So the foot goes flat, knee bends in like that. We call that a valgus, I'm sorry, I forget the, we call that a valgus stress on the knee. That's causing the knee to actually rotate so that can also cause some patella subluxations. So again, I went to a, a patella femoral course many years ago. And one of the things they said was the majority of patella subluxations is due to tibial instability um, because the, basically the patella floats. It's not connected to anything. It's connected um, basically through two ligaments and a, a thing called your retinaculum and basically when the tibia rotates, it brings the patella with it. So if we can control that valgus stress, we can actually reduce the patella subluxation. I would say with my 
BDS population that have hypermobile patellas, um, I would say 90% of my population, when I actually fix the tibia and the foot, the patella subluxations go away. Um, I do do some McConnell taping to the other 10% to help work on it, um, but we'll actually try to fix that with the biomechanics. And I always say, when you're looking at it, um, the knee is just kind of a crappy joint to begin with biomechanically. It's a joint in between two long bones, so the force that goes through it is incredible. And again, you don't have a lot of musculature that fixes this. You have a little muscle, which is called your popliteus muscle, which is about this big. I don't know what that muscle is going to do for me, but it's going to do nothing. So the majority of the control of the knee is coming from the foot and as well as the hip, primarily glute medius and glute minimus. So we need to actually work on that to strengthen it. So when you look at my protocol, we're looking at hip strengthening and we're looking at controlling the foot. So uh, we'll assess the knee, we'll tape the knee. That's a mulligan technique that we use for the, the manual physiotherapists uh, that are here and also a mulligan taping to work on the tibia that's rotating. Um, also, there's a little bone called your fibula which can actually go out. We'll tape that as well. We'll also assess your gait as well to see how you do pre-taping and post-taping. And really we're looking to see how you're feeling better. Our job is to get you with the tape job to try to get you as close to zero pain that first day as we can. Finally, we're gonna go belly button up. And again, I talk about mid back, head, shoulders, elbows, knees, wrist, hands. Again, the name of my lecture when I do this, when I do with the physicians, it's called the shoulder runs the show. Um, basically your shoulder goes forward, but it also subluxes inferiorly. All right, and the reason why it um, sublux is inferiorly because um, gravity is just always pulling it down all the time. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at a couple of things. We're gonna look at your posture and we're gonna look at posture with or without shoulder subluxation. So how do we do that? Is I'm gonna look at your posture before you even come in. I'm gonna measure your forward head posture. So how far your head is forward. Um, I've had as much as four or five inches is fairly normal in this population that I see. Um, that really doesn't exist in the non-EDS population. Usually one or two people are freaking out pretty good. Um, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually have you squeeze shoulder blades back and I'm gonna measure it again because forward head posture can come from the mid back, it can come from the neck or it can come from the shoulders. Those are the three places it can come from. So once we measure that, we're then gonna tape your shoulders which is a tape job, which is um, we tape it backwards and up to try to fix that uh, um, shoulder to keep it stable. Then we're gonna measure the posture again. And we're also gonna see is does the shoulder affect the neck? So if my shoulder is subluxed down, it's like this. So my upper trap's gonna be tight. My scaling's gonna be tight. I could have a sublux first and second rib. I can have my scapula pulled out, pulling my ribs out. So the, all those things are gonna occur for you. And again, it could just be from the shoulder. So once we tape the shoulder, we wanna see what has actually helped. Has my mid back pain going away? Has my neck pain going away? We've had people come into my clinic ready for neurosurgery after I tape their shoulders, they have zero neck pain. So we actually know that that's the shoulder that's running the show there, not the neck. And we need to fix that. So after we do that, um, we're gonna look at evaluating your first and second rib, because again, your scaling muscles attached there, those are those big muscles on the side of your neck. And they can cause a lot of issues like thoracic outlet syndrome and things like that. And once we fix that, we'll put those scaling muscles to rest so they won't be in spasm just to see if it's really a true muscle spasm in the scaling or just an elevated first rib and laterally flexed second rib. Finally, we'll look at the thoracic spine. Again, Dr. Mark Brookhouse from the University of Michigan State basically talks about rib pain. He looks at the biomechanics of the rib um, and neck, and he says the neck starts biomechanically at T7 and goes all the way up. So any problems with the thoracic spine T7 and up will actually affect the biomechanics of the neck and can cause neck pain. So we have to look at all that. And then finally, we're gonna actually look at the neck. <laughs> so. And after that, we're gonna do a little bit of manual traction. Again, that is for me to decide whether we have a bulging disc 
or if you do some manual traction to the OA, you can actually help uh, alleviate some pain from Chiari, and that's just a way to say that if you need to go to neurosurgery or not. Um, and finally, we look at the TMJ. After that, we're gonna look at the elbow, wrist, hand, and fingers, all right? This is my tough group right here, okay? So there's no muscle attachment to the, to the wrist, very little muscle attachment to the hands and fingers, and the elbow is tough because it usually is unstable medial and laterally, so you get that lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, but it's usually due to an instability medial or laterally or in and out is how it goes. So there are mulligan techniques that you can use, my manual therapist, to fix that. Um, but again, there's not a lot of stuff there to strengthen, so we gotta protect those joints as much as possible. Major issues for my wrist and hand and thumb are computer work. Um, iPads, computer. Um, so we gotta make sure that we're, we're either stabilizing with a Futuro sports wrap, or I think Dr. Chopra talked about the arthritis gloves that we use, or ring splints. The Dynasplint people are there to help you guys out today, um, working with those things. Um, but the other thing we actually talk about, and I talked about this yesterday, is people with POTS. Um, who has POTS here? Anybody been diagnosed? All right. So that's a major problem for your hands and wrists. And again, I have to do it, I have to go around, and I apologize to people online. But again, when you get up, you get dizzy, you basically do this to stabilize yourself. When you do it on a bed, you're going to sublux your wrist, you're going to sublux your thumb and all of your fingers. So what I tell everybody is when you get up, you got to fist it. All right, that's the first thing you do. And you, they all do it. Um, again, I treat 125 people a week, so it's, I do this all day. So you got to really work on that because if your thumb goes, your fingers go, it's really, really tough to stabilize that with strengthening once we get that to be at a stage where I can't stabilize it anymore. There are manual therapy techniques to work on the wrist. Um, there are manual therapy techniques to fix the thumb, the fingers, and all that. But again, we're looking for long-term success so something I can strengthen afterwards to keep it stable forever. And that's what our, our goal is for you guys, is to be a little bit better than you were coming into the clinic. Um, again, we don't work on function too much. We work on pain and pain reduction. My philosophy is if you're in less pain, you're gonna be way more functional. So that's, that's what we look at here. Um, our treatment philosophy. So there's two things we do at EDS, very simple. All right, there's manual therapy and exercise. That's all we do. All right, so it's, it's no mumbo jumbo. So we do myofascial release, cranial sacral, mulligan techniques, taping techniques. We do it to align joints. We want to decrease muscle spasm. We want to decrease inflammation in the joints. We want to allow the body to heal. All right, and we also want to decrease pain for a while. We never do manual therapy on a joint that is not being strengthened. So again, when you have muscle spasm, spasticity is a neurological response to hypermobility. It is not your fault that your muscles in spasm in any way, shape, or form. So when we do manual therapy, we get rid of that muscle spasm, and we're very good at that as manual therapists. So, but again, that's allowing that joint to be a little bit more stable. So if we just get rid of that spasm, your joint is gonna be less stable. How many times you go to a massage therapist, you get a massage and you feel awesome. Next day you feel horrible, all right? Because they got rid of that spasm, all right? So they did their job. If you don't reactivate that muscle, the spasm is just gonna come back and you're gonna feel worse the next day because your joint's more hypermobile and you're gonna have more inflammation in the joint. So all of our patients get manual therapy and then they go out to the gym and strengthen immediately afterwards. So that whole thing is I feel really good, I shouldn't strengthen, that's when you wanna strengthen is when you feel really good. Who wants to strengthen when they're in pain? Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So I try to use common sense. The only thing that gives long lasting relief is exercise. So you can go to manual therapy and again, before I wrote this book, you know, I treated EDS for three years just by manual therapy. People loved me. They thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bananas, but nobody got better. You know, they just kept coming and coming and coming. And I said, there had to be a better way. It didn't make sense to me as a manual therapist that just kept coming. 
And some of them actually got worse, which doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. And the component was the exercise component. We need to actually strengthen that up. And if we don't strengthen, we're in trouble, okay? So you can go to a manual therapist for your entire life, and we actually have manual therapists in America that don't do exercise, and EDS for the long term don't really get much better. So exercise is the only thing you can do. Um, you need to strengthen the muscles around the joint so it can absorb external forces. Like I said, that's what we're here for, is we're here to absorb external forces. So. My ligamentous structure, my muscular strength is stronger than you guys. So again, I can do dumber things before I get hurt. So basically my job is to get you strong enough to have more room for error. So when you're weak and you're inflamed, you have less room for error. So, and we use braces and techniques to go through the protocol. The other thing I talk about and Kathleen talked about is this inflammatory response, the systemic response to muscle strength. And I think that's a big thing that I talk about with my patients all the time. So when you have a systemic response, POTS, mast cell, food allergy is a big one for me. And all of a sudden you're globally inflamed, that impedes muscle activation neurophysiologically. So when you wake up, all right, and I tell my patients, and you're having an EDS day where everything hurts, do you really think EDS woke up and said, I'm gonna really screw this person today? No, it's usually some kind of systemic response that's going on in your body, which is shutting your muscle down, shutting the activation off. And what it's doing is it's not allowing you to absorb those forces that you just absorbed yesterday. My big one is food allergies. I'm a big food allergy test person. Everybody who comes to my clinic, make sure they get a food allergy test. Because again, with food allergies, you eat something that's bad, you get globally inflamed. 48 hours later, you feel better. All right, that's pretty much the EDS way, all right? And that's thousands of patients that I see all the time. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, you shouldn't eat the things that you shouldn't eat, but I mean, again, we, we live in the real world. You're not gonna follow the diet. We all know that, <laughs> all right? I live in reality. So they're gonna tell you how it should go. I, I live in the muck, that's what it is. And you're not gonna follow it, but you're gonna be more, you know, understanding about it and say, hey, I ate something bad. I wanted that ice cream and I got it. Tomorrow I'm gonna to feel pretty bad. Pretty much I don't wanna have a really hard day that day because you're gonna feel bad <laughs> and that's it. So my hardest day as a physical therapist is Monday because nobody follows a diet on the weekends. I don't care who you are. <laughs> EDS isn't any different. <laughs> again, I live in the muck, that's what it is. So again, they come in, they say, I feel like crap. I ate my ice cream, shut up and fix me, Kevin. That's it, we don't have a lecture about it. We just do our thing. And that's just how, how we live with it, you know? And we have to live with this. So this is some of the things that, you know, I'm not gonna give you a lecture on. I'm gonna say, you know, you gotta know what it is. And you gotta make decisions what's best for your life. Um, do not hurt the joints, and that's why we do our book. And I'm gonna talk about my book now. So people ask me all the time is why, is my book gonna help me? And I tell people like this, if you're doing good at what you do, you're doing good with your therapist, don't buy my book. You're not where you wanna be, then that's what my book's for. You know, why did I actually create a book? And basically I tell everybody is I, oops, story of my life. Uh, um, I created the book basically to say, how do I fix somebody with EDS as I'm doing manual therapy to them? All right, what joints sublux and why do they sublux? And we basically sat down, um, me and a couple of therapists, and we basically in our mind severed every ligament in the human body. And we said, if this ligament isn't working, what muscles will help that ligament? Because that's really what we care about as PTs. Then we went in and said, okay, what exercise is gonna help you? So I'm gonna tell you a good, good uh, example is, is, does it help the joint and does it hurt other joints? So a big exercise for all my patients um, who come to me is side lying hip abduction. You sit down on your side and you lift your leg up or you do side lying clams. That is a great exercise for the hip. Totally subluxes your shoulder, but a great exercise for your hip. So you come in with a, with a hip problem, you leave with a shoulder problem, that's awesome, right? No. So we had to look at all of those exercises to make sure. And then we basically had all our EDS patients go through those exercises to make sure they didn't get hurt. 
you know, before we put them in our book. So again, at that point, I was already seeing 100 patients. So I already had a bunch of EDS patients that were willing to go through the protocol, not knowing if it's going to hurt them or help them at that point. We call them the guinea pigs of EDS at that point. <laughs> I have five minutes. That's perfect. Ten, even better. I could talk forever if you want. Um, so basically, I'll just quickly go with my book. And if you have questions about the book, I'm here and Kathleen's here. So we'll, we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. There's basically four chapters. There's really five chapters in my book. The first chapter basically is just EDS in a nutshell, basically what I'm telling you right now. It's written for the patient and it's also written for the physical therapist. So the physical therapist part has like the big words in it and the patient has the easy words you know you can read both if you want but it's really 400 pages so you can do whatever you want uh chapter two works on the si joint the low back and the hips because i truly believe that is actually the core that you actually have to get strengthened up because if you don't have that biomechanically your pelvic bone is actually considered the top part of the leg and your si or that triangular bone your sacrum is kind of the bottom part of the spine so if there's a problem there, it can affect the legs down and the spine up. So it's very important to actually get that stabilized. And again, I was just talking to someone, when you're looking at the SI joint, you got to look for an upslip. An upslip is a major dysfunction defined by Dr. Fred Mitchell who, um, and Fred Mitchell Jr. who did uh, talked about sacral dysfunctions and things like that. And again, that's a major dysfunction that needs to get fixed and needs to figure out how we actually fix it. Um, we do it a little differently than Dr. Mitchell would attend. We usually, Dr. Mitchell tells us to pull on the leg and pull it down. That'll dislocate your knee and your ankle. So we usually push down on the, the iliac crest and push it. I have a webinar on my um, website, moldownypt.com, that you can click on. It's about SI joint dysfunction. It's about, I don't know, half hour me talking about SI and kind of how we differentiate and change things for EDS. Um, then chapter three is the next shoulder and we need to stabilize that. Finally, we got chapter four, which is the feet and knees. We actually have a phase two where we get into more functional exercises. But again, for me, if we're working on balance and you don't have any strength in your hip, how can you possibly balance correctly? So I believe that you have to start with individually strengthening the muscles first and then add closed chain exercises to it. Um, and again, it just makes more sense to me biomechanically that if you don't have strength, how can you have a hip ankle strategy? It doesn't make a lot of sense uh, biomechanically. Um, our program is a layered approach. We do everything for time. The American Physical Therapy Association said that it takes three minutes to, to activate a core muscle. So who might argue with the American Physical Therapy Association? So you gotta do it for three minutes. <laughs> so, um, so again, I try to plagiarize as many smart people as humanly possible in my career. Um, we need to go in order, we need to progress because we're looking for getting um, a complete uh, strengthening the entire joint itself and having some symmetry to it. Um, again, I actually did this through trial and error. So back when I started, there was really nothing, um, absolutely zero. So I tell people I know what to do and I darn well know what not to do in this world. <laughs> All right, so um, it, it was a good ride at the beginning to try to figure this stuff out but I think we got it pretty good now and we're doing pretty good. All of my patients do the book. So why do some of the activities hurt? I'll kind of go through it. A slumbing posture, so when you sit and you slump, is 150% of your body weight on your disc. So I usually roll up a towel and stick it under to give you a little bit more lumbar lordosis. So everybody sits like this. That's the EDS posture. I see everybody doing it right now. All right, that puts a lot of stress on you. Um, your center of gravity is about your belly button. Technically, if you want to be technical, it's a little bit lower at S2, but we'll, we'll say the belly button to make it easier. So when we're carrying objects, we want to carry things at our belly button. So if we, if we pick up an object, we bring it out here, all right, or try to lift something from out here, you're going to see that it's a lot more stress on your back, shoulders, and arms instead of getting up close and bringing it to your body. Just something simple like that, carrying things helps you tremendously. 
um, force is equal to mass times uh, moment arm. Basically all it says is when I lift something, my moment arm is just the lever arm that I have, the farther out it is, it's whatever that object is times that length. So if I decrease the length, it's much easier. Ground reaction forces I already talked about. It's three times your body weight walking, 10 times your body weight running. So we do not let anybody run unless you're being chased by a bear. All right, that's the only time I let anybody run in my clinic. All right, every inch your head is forward is 10 pounds of compressor force on your spine. So again, we need to work on that. Hello, I'm Sarah. I was diagnosed with EDS about a year ago. I was in a lot of pain when I came to see Kevin. And then I went through the entire Muldowney protocol, and now I'm in zero pain. <laughs> and I'm feeling really good, and I'm being discharged today. It's been a year and a day since I started the protocol, and I feel really good. All right, so again, that's one of our patients. She came in, she didn't think she was going to be able to go to college. She didn't think anything. She was a junior in high school. She was getting homeschooled. Um, her friends, she couldn't go out with her friends. So we went her through the entire protocol. We fixed her SI, her knees, her hips. She graduated at phase two. She went to college. She now works full time in Boston, which is about an hour and a half away from me, doing really well. All right. And again, she didn't have any of the systemic or neurological issues. She was strictly a biomechanical person. So she was very easy to fix because we just fixed the biomechanics. I think I'm done.